So, last thing before, before we leave um, chapter two, which we're going to do very quickly here, I just want to see if you have any questions. Um, we ended by uh, what can be a somewhat, you know, interesting but maybe a little bit confusing topic, and that was when we looked at the kind of the problem of epilepsy, and we talked about the way in which epileptic seizures influence uh, the whole brain, um, that one, most of the time these are treated with medications that calm or stop many of the seizures. In some cases it doesn't, and we showed video, a couple video clips of one in which they do surgery uh, to remove the part of the brain that may have some damaged areas, and you saw that in one clip, and then another clip where they actually sever the left and right hemisphere right here, and then you saw toward the end some of the results that um, could occur. But are there any questions as you look this over, anything before we go and start talking about, well, we're gonna talk about prenatal development today and, and uh, even um, infants and the and development of the brain. Yes? Um, my aunt had epilepsy and she had epilepsy and surgery. Uh, I don't know if it was a how, how long ago? Three or four years, yeah. There are some ways in which some treatments, there's a variety of ways, in, in essence, probably, which, well, do you know what she had? In, was it a, a monitor that monitored her uh, brain patterns and then just kind of sent out medications as needed? Don't know. Find out. It'd be interesting to see what that treatment was and what she had done. Um, uh, these are more severe cases, and uh, individuals that um, have this surgery are pretty much like you and I. If, if you, right now, if you're looking at me and hearing me, you're hearing me through both eyes and both ears, so both hemispheres get it. But even if you were able to only hear out of one ear, it would still be shared on both hemispheres. But, for example, um, if you put something in, you know, someone that had this surgery, if you put it, which hand, if I put an object that you can identify by touch, let's say it's a, let's say it's a toothbrush. Um, which hand, for someone with split brain surgery, would be best for them to be able to tell you that which they are holding in their hand? You can only, f for the majority of people that have had this surgery, they would fall into this category where if you put a toothbrush in one of their hands, they couldn't tell you what it was. What hand would that be in that they couldn't tell you? It would be in their left hand because it would go to their to their right hemisphere, which has simple comprehension. And so guess what they did? They put it in her left hand, the person that you saw at the very end of the clip with surgery that had this, and she went like this. Well, she said, without seeing it, it's an elongated piece of plastic. And it has what appears to be, and she started to describe it, but what is it? I don't, she couldn't say. Isn't that interesting? And then she did something that actually changed it. She went like this. She went like that on the brushes, and that went over to this ear, when she went, she goes, oh, that's a, that's a toothbrush. Isn't that weird? Well, what happens is, again, most of the time she's taking in information that's going into both hemispheres, and so it's sharing, and you and I will never have this problem because our hemispheres share this information very quickly, so even if I whisper in one ear or put something in this hand, you'll know it because the information is being shared. In this case, she didn't. You could flash up something to her like this, ready? They did this, they said, to her uh, left hemisphere, which has language, um, they said for her to, um, let's see, what was it? Uh, to laugh, that's what it said. But w into her right hemisphere, it said, uh, to the other hemisphere, sorry, it said to clap, right, at the same time. So she went like this, ha <laughs> ha. And then you say, what are you doing? She goes, ah, <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Why, what are you doing? What, did, what word did you see? Laugh. Why are you doing that? I don't know. Make sense? She was able to identify and speak out the word that she saw into her left hemisphere, which was laugh, while her right hemisphere saw the word clap, and she kind of did it without really understanding or being able to speak why. Weird situations, you have to be able to know how to get information into one hemisphere 
and not the other. Most of the time that doesn't, isn't a problem. So do you understand the basic principle? And so now what that did for psychology is it opened up where in the world, what, what, again, it's a unique case because for us, we share this information back and forth. We don't run into this, but it does bring up interesting questions about how and why we do things. And it illustrates something that sometimes our behaviors, if you wanna know, sometimes we act or behave in a particular way that we're not always sure why. Sometimes we're not even aware of these things that we pick up from other people. We just get kind of a sense. We call this even that idea of even, not, some of us, you know, some parts that we're aware of, we know that there are things, like this, this idea of the low road of consciousness that we process through a part of our brain that doesn't really have awareness. It doesn't tell us, or we're not simply conscious of it. We just feel that something is wrong. Well, we just get a sense that the person's not happy by reading some things that strike us, and that's kind of a similar analogy, um, where we're kind of aware of things. Millions and millions of bits of information strike our brains in minutes, and so we're only select selectively aware of parts of that. But our brains are picking up a lot of it and informing impressions and feelings. So it's kind of analogous to something like that. But. No, not necessarily our left. Again, f for most people, when uh, you tend to process most of your speech right here. Most of language and, and being able to talk is, is the product of, of the left hemisphere, let's say. You can comprehend things over here, but uh, not have as much capacity, or this doesn't have. So again, it, for all of us with this intact, it doesn't necessarily hinder us in any way, but that's just the way it works. Okay, uh, other questions like that? But, yeah, go ahead. Now that's a great question. You saw two different clips, the guy at first that had this and the girl, uh, the woman that had it. No, they both had, they were both tested uh, by the same guy, a guy named Michael Gazaniga, who has, once this surgery has occurred, has done some of the, this testing that, that um, brings out some of these possible problems that they may be experiencing. She didn't seem to have, um, um, in the long run, it, she was f fairly normal. Initially, there was some tension. You saw her like, I don't even, part of her right hand wanted to wear this and her left hand would grab another thing. She's like, which one? And eventually that faded for her. And it wasn't as much of an issue. Um, by the way, also, the, all, both of them, their seizures uh, were significantly decreased and, and, and contained. So that was the whole hope. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of brains, and ultimately the development um, is a very important piece that we're going to transition to when it comes to children um, and us as adults. Where and why and how did this amazing uh, organ called the brain, you know, what was its process and its journey to think through this idea uh, developmental psychologists and others that work in, in, in uh, understanding uh, some of these things point to milestones in uh, fetal brain development, for example. Um, they break it down into trimesters, as you know, so I have this up here. You don't have to write down all that I'm about to show on this particular sl screen. I just want you to get a sense of some of the um, areas and some of the speed at which the brain grows and develops um, and some of the milestones that we find at different times. So in that first trimester, as you know, in the first couple of months when um, uh, the baby is first developing and growing, uh, we see the brain cells uh, clearly um, are beginning to be differentiated within even a couple of weeks after conception. Uh, you see a brain stem uh, within the first two months of life for these babies. Um, and so you'll find uh, seven weeks along a brain stem, face, uh, hands, and feet, just to show you some physical features as well, by eight weeks. And so um, this um, point at which the brain becomes functioning or the brain operates, because our society uh, and uh, many scientists say that you are only human until your brain, and not, and not until your brain is up and functioning, has huge implications, doesn't it? That is, if you're not really human until your brain is up and, f up and functioning, 
uh, or online, then they can argue that things, for example, ending the life of this baby isn't a problem because it's not fully human. And so you can see why the argument is important to recognize, well, let's think about the brain. When does life begin? Um, and while it's not really an easy answer for even scientists, they can start to point to some things about the brain. And by the way, new technology is revealing more and more about the workings that go on that we didn't know before. How many have ever seen a technology of um, the 4D sonograms? Any of y'all seen that? Yeah. Do you ha do it? Know it? Here. You what? Oh, you're one of the techs for the 4D. Well, maybe you can describe it. Here, I'll show you what it is. Tell us what we see. By the way, here's the story. We now peer into the womb using something that we used to go call it just a sonogram, right? So here I am. I ha we have kids that are now close to your age, and we go into the doctor's office, and the nurse goes like this. Oh, let's check out and show you the baby. And if you ever, how many of y'all seen the images of the sonogram? Little baby in there. It looks like um, it looks like a gray and white blob. <laughs> Except for to you. What's your name? Courtney. Courtney. Well, we'll let Courtney say. Well, to me, I look at it, so like 17, 18 years ago, they showed me this thing. Oh, look at the baby. Look and see the heart. I'm going, dude, that looks like a piece of gum. Uh, <laughs> I see nothing. And so they're like, oh, no, it's so cool. Look, and there's the heart. Oh, everything looks great. I'm thinking, wow, you're really good. Because I see nothing here that's really of any value at all. Now, I know I shouldn't say that, but that's what I felt. And, but you want me to show you what that looks like? You know, most of, most of you have seen them, and they look kind of like this. What do you see there? I see more here than I do there. Courtney, what do we have here? Um, that's, a, that's a nose and a mouth and an eye. A nose, a mouth, and an eye. You see the hand. That's what Courtney sees. Courtney sees lots of things in here because this is what she does as a technician. I, I, but anyway, so here's my point. I go in, we have these babies, it's cool. I'm, I'm like, oh, that's cool. You hear the heartbeat, you can see a little bit, and I'm all happy. Okay, fast forward 10 years later. Now I go in, we have, we're having another baby. There was a big gap for us. Um, and uh, did I tell you about why we have a big gap? because we, we, well, we, we don't plan very well. <laughs> and we just were surprised. And all of a sudden, at least one day, by the way, the reason we didn't have babies for a long time was we stopped them because my wife has something. During this time, something weird, weird happens. When you moms are first pregnant, there's a very interesting phenomenon that the, this baby needs to stick to the, the uterine wall, right? And so this new forming egg sticks, well in order to stick it, your mom, the moms develop this kind of glue, it's a, it's a hormone chemical, and for some moms it makes you very what? Very sick, very nauseated. And for some, like my wife, we were in Russia at the time, we were walking around, hanging out, living there over the summer, and she's basically getting sick, and I think, oh yeah, I'm getting sick too, and, and we were having bad you know, food, and they're thinking, you know, this isn't good, bad food, blah, blah, whatever, and I'm getting better the next day or two, and she's still sick, and she's throwing up all over the country. I mean, she's throwing up <laughs> in the Red Square, she's throwing up, we moved, traveled to, to you, Kiev, she's throwing up there, everywhere. And I was like, she's not getting better, and she's still sick and still sick. Turns out we don't know why. Finally, you know, a couple weeks into it, the dog says, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I have a feeling. Are you really sensitive to smells right now? And she's like, oh, this country stinks. <laughs> and I'm like, at least this country doesn't smell. It's just, like, just a different place. Oh, no, it's really bad. Well, it turns out they didn't have a lot of good tests back then that were easily accessible. So we get on a plane, we fly, no, because we were ending our time, we fly back home, we get to an airport, and the, she grabs a pregnancy test, she goes, oh, this is it, look. And so what it is, she, we, we were pregnant, and, ready, go to a doctor, they diagnose her with something called hyperemesis gravidurum. Bad, bad thing. Emesis means throwing up. Hyperemesis means what? All the time. <laughs> So hyperly throwing up means like every 45 minutes, this woman is throwing up every 45 minutes. And gravidurum means it's in grave danger to the uh, spouse, to, to the spouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it felt like. 
because the noise, man, is like, oh, not really. It was grave danger to the mom, not to the baby, not to the spouse, but to the mom. The baby took all the nutrients. So she's throwing up, by the way, she, she was throwing up so much, you, you couldn't even, she was unable to even swallow her own saliva. All of her food and liquid for about two months came in through pick lines that the doctors had to insert. And so we'd have dinner together and I'd get a bag of food and stick it up there like that and then I'd eat my hamburger. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. It was painful to watch her go through this. So just to fast forward the story, we have a second child a year later, and guess what happens? The same thing. Hyperemesis, gravidurum, and she's throwing up, and she wa mostly she wants to kill me, first of all. <laughs> and I just say, that's just really misplaced. I did it, well I did, okay, but. <laughs> I didn't know, how could I know? So anyway, by, uh, fast forward. The whole point of the story is we stopped having children because she was sick, hyperemesis is bad. And so 10 years later, all of a sudden, she get, we're at some biola function and she looks at me, she goes, does it stink in here? And I say, no, it doesn't stink at all. She whoo, it smells bad. And then she starts throwing up and I go, oh, well, that's, well, we're done with children. So it's not a problem. The next day she's still nauseated and she's just looking at me like, I'm still not feeling good. I'm not going to go to the meeting. I go, go away, and she calls me up. She goes, ah, Chris, I know what's wrong. I figured it out. And I went, oh, no, is there blood? What? How do you know what's wrong with you? Because I wasn't thinking, babe. And she holds this thing, and I could see on her face, it was like joy, and I'm going to kill you bad. <laughs> Look, we're going to have a baby, man. And she's throwing up. Oh, it was horrible. Same thing, same doctors. We go to the same place. It was bad, bad it, food. It was so bad. Can I tell you one more story? And all of her food and her liquid have to go in. <laughs> There's music, huh? Like, this is so bad. Oh, we feel really bad for you. It was so bad that all of her, uh, uh, um, you know, she had to get all these pokes in her arms, you know, to, to, and, and then veins would collapse after a while. You couldn't use them. You had to switch them over to other arms to get more and back and forth and find this other vein just to get the food in and these pick lines. Finally, they put a permanent one in. <gasps> With our second kid, it comes out. She's kind of out of it, you meaning the, the, the worst part of it. She can slightly begin to hold down food. Um, and it's about three days later, and here's what happens. Uh, she's sitting there one night and uh, she's going to sleep, uh, we, we both are, and I fell asleep really fast, and uh, I hear this, she's up restless, and then she goes, oh Chris, something's wrong, my stomach hurts, or my side hurts, and I go, is it the baby? I mean, we just, you know, we're here, we're halfway through this pregnancy, and she says, um, she goes, I don't know, it's more on the side, and it hurts a lot, and I said, okay, well, what should I do? She goes, I think I'll just get up for a while, you just stay in bed, you'll be fine. So I do what any sensitive husband would do, I fall back asleep, and, uh, <laughs> And so I'm asleep and I hear a few minutes, kind of, you know, 10 minutes later, she comes back in and she goes, it still hurts. And I said, oh, really? What do we do? What should we do? She goes, I don't know. I think I'm going to maybe try something to eat. And so I said, you all right? What, what, is it really bad? She goes, I don't know. Let me just, so anyway, she goes to get something to eat and, and I, I fall back asleep. <laughs> and um, about 10 minutes later, I heard, it just, it just was one word. And I knew it was really serious because this is my wife. She, she, this isn't her, I mean. <laughs> I'm sitting there, and what wakes me up was this word. And I, I, forgive me, but I hear, damn. And I go, oh. <laughs> you cussed, man. <laughs> I'm calling the doctor. <laughs> that, I'm the cusser, not you. <laughs> you cussed. This is bad. I've never heard. Oh, I called the doctor. My wife is bad. She, why? Well, she cussed, man. She just said. <laughs> A bad word. He's like, what happened? She got pain here, but bring her in. So we bring her into the emergency room. We get there, and the doctor takes one. I don't know why I'm telling you this whole story. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so we get there, and, and, and they look at her, and, they, and uh, they start to figure out what this pain is, and she's like, oh, it really hurts, bad, bad, bad. And one of the doctors at the ER pulls me aside, and she goes, oh, uh, she says, is, uh, does this your wife? And I say, yeah, it's my wife. And uh, she goes, oh, she's a user, huh? And I go, a user? Mm, I, what do you mean? Well, I could see all the track marks. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, I said, she didn't. She just cussed, man, that's all. No. 
I said, no, she, she's, she's, you know, she's pregnant, and she has hyperemesis graviderm, and it, she goes, oh. And she's been on the, ah, yeah. She, by the way, what it was, she had a kidney stone, of all things. And she would rather give birth to a baby than a kidney stone if she had her choice. It was that painful. All that to say, let's try and finish the story very quickly. I don't know how to finish it. Um, we go back in, now we have the third child, 10 years later, I go to the same place, almost the same place, and they hook it up and they say, hey, we'll show you your baby. And I go into them and I say, you, and they pull out the same old thing, that little, you know, uh, what is it called? What? Transducer, and it's the same, and I say to the lady, I saw this like 10 years ago. There's like a technological revolution going on. We have new software and computers. They're weird, they're cool. <laughs> and you could see things, all, and she goes, oh no, stupid doctor, we still, do you still use them? Sonic, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. How about the old things though? You still use just regular sonograms? Depending on where you are, anyway. So, and I said, gosh, you guys ought to upgrade sometime. And she goes, you know what? There is this cool new thing called 4D technology. It's called a sonogram. Go do it. Don't tell my doctor. So we went and did it. You know, I'll show you what it looks like. And this is the different image that you get. Instead of that. Watch. You can even see her yawn. It's a she. In just a minute, watch. It's that. It's live. The eye looks a little weird, don't get distracted, but there's the yawn. <laughs> Is that pretty clear or good? Uh -huh. that, that was pretty, that was a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit later than this, um, but it was amazing. We sit there, by the way, this technology has changed our opinions about lots of things. We have now found out things that they, these babies can do inside the womb that we weren't really always aware of before. Um, and it has uh, just even made uh, something that was un before you couldn't see. Now you see it and it, it's just surprising, the clarity. Anything that you've learned from that or you watch or that's cool about it? Oh, you can reach, you can detect, she says, uh, certain physical abnormalities like cleft, cleft palates and other things, cleft lips that you couldn't have seen before. And um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's very expensive. But when we did it, was, there was only like two or three in all of California. Um, well, a couple, of, now there's more than that, but 28 weeks um, is, a, is a very powerful time the, uh, for the fetus. Um, Sometime between, just so you know, and again, I'm not going to hold you responsible for these weeks and exactly what happens. So you don't, I mean, I think it's interesting. You don't have to necessarily memorize this list. Um, but uh, something, it, it goes on with the, it, you know, in development, the 23rd week, if a baby was born prematurely, any of you all in here premature that you know of? You're, how many, anybody in here know that you were a couple weeks or days premature? Any, even a month? Premature? Do we have any? Wow, how, how, how much do you remember? Like two, months. two months premature. That's a, that's a long time. That's probably at what? Do you remember at what week you were at? 30? Maybe 32 weeks? That's around the 32nd week. That's pretty early. Three months? And twin sister. So that would have been at the 28th week which is getting down to very premature. I'll talk a little bit about this at the end of today's lecture or at the beginning of tomorrow, uh, Mondays, about how we treated premature infants and we treat them very differently now. By the way, a baby born, okay, 28 weeks, you remember, is that when you were about born? Uh, survival rates, just real quickly to show you how, what this window is. If a baby is born at 23 weeks premature, um, even though this says the fetus can survive, at 23 weeks, only 10% of babies that are born this premature survive. 23 weeks. But at 26 weeks, just in that three weeks, it re completely reverses. And so now 90% survive outside the womb at around 26 weeks. 
the technology, other things are helping keep these babies alive, um, even before we, uh, you know, it, we're sort of pushing that bounds. But there's some magical things that happen. Question somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, uh, I, uh, I wouldn't know specifically if one month is worse. I mean, it seemed like, I, I would think there's a little bit more maturing that's going on. Maybe there are things, I haven't heard that, but it uh, doesn't mean it's not true. But usually the more weight the baby gets, the more development they get, the better off and more likely chance they have uh, of surviving and, yeah. Yeah, usually they, the moms don't, they, uh, they don't let moms go much beyond about a week uh, to 10 days beyond their due date. Some of, some of you may have been a little bit longer, but it certainly wouldn't be a month longer, I don't think. But it was for me. A month? They told me I was supposed to be on the 2nd of November, I was born on the 22nd. Oh yeah, so that's ten, uh, 20 days, almost two and a half weeks, three weeks, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Miscarriages... Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know if there's a specific time or week that are more likely, but we'll ask maybe our expert that. Most are in the first 12 weeks. For, within the first 12 weeks would be. But it can go up to 20. Yeah, and then up, yeah, so. How premature Well, again, if at 23 weeks since conception, you have a 10% survival rate. That mean, I imagine there have been some babies that have bo been born at 21 or 22 weeks. It's probably rare that many survive, but that would be what I would imagine is around that time. By the way, this points up to something amazing to me, and that is something uh, that's very powerful, uh, even, even just in this verse, ready? First John 3, 1, you don't have to write it down, but how great is the love the Father has for us, right? and that he has lavished this upon us. This to me, as a parent, for the first time I realized this verse, that we are called children of God and that is what we are. Um, why would a new parent find this amazing? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a whole lot of, there's a lot against you even being born in general. What else, why is this amazing? If, if you heard parents talk about this, it's an amazing love, man. If it, it, you'll do, that baby comes out and like, I'll do anything to protect this kid, right? But we didn't want children uh, right away because we wanted our, our, our uh, you know, marriage to. I, I'm thinking, I don't want, I can't love anybody more than I love Elisa, and so why would I bring a baby in that's going to get second best? Have you ever thought about that before? Maybe you haven't because maybe you're not married. But have you guys thought about that before? Do you want to bring children in and not now? Not now yeah, <laughs> let's not talk about it. It's, it's, yeah, not yet, right? We wanted to wait three, four, five years, and I honestly, as you get to know your spouse a lot, and you're going, God, this is awesome. I can't love a baby as much as this, and then all of a sudden you have a baby, and you go, Oh, I do love them a lot. I don't, I, and it didn't take away from this. It just, and then I thought, I can't have another baby beyond this because that baby will get second best. And then it's like, wait a minute, I do love that baby. And so I keep, let's try again, Lisa. She's like, I'll kill you. No, <laughs> we're not having another one, man. I'm sick. And so, anyway, all that to say, I had a hard time. But the way the reason we had the third child was simply because I, I always thought I kept telling Lisa, I think we, maybe they'll maybe they'll cure this thing. Just just hold out hope, man. Hold out, and she's like, hope, smoke, I'm sick, and I don't want to have a baby. So, but I, I wanted like 10, just to see if it was true that you could still love them as much as the next one. And you can, and God loves us this way, and when you hear this and you think, I love this kid so much, it's so deep, so powerful, and you realize, wait a minute, God calls me a child? Ooh, y'all just know you're, you're loved a lot. <laughs> How's that? Hear that verse, you're loved a lot. In developmental psychology, we're gonna talk about three quick things that have determined and, and have an influence on the field. Um, in a broad sense, um, they're easy to answer and, and, and they're complex in some respects. One is the nature-nurture issue and that is kind of that, that idea that if we wanted to explain person's behavior or uh, an individual why they might do something and some people say, oh, it's because of their genetic background or it's because of their experience and that's known as the nature-nurture issue and this has had a big influence um, in developmental psychology 
Um, it's not unsimilar to what the psalmist said in 139 when he pointed out this and said something to this effect, and you don't have to write the verse down, but you'll find in 13 to 16 that God created us in our innermost beings, right? He knit us together in our mother's womb. Well, that's pretty powerful that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, Our frame was not hidden from God when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. God, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me. They were written in your book before one of them came to be. Well, here's the idea. How much of who you are was written while you were developing? Genetically, you were given 23 chromosomes from your mom and 23 from your dad, okay? They paired up. Now you find this in every, literally every cell in the body, these pairs. They have influenced us, but how much? How much of your behavior is a result of your genetics? That's the question. Are you shy, we talked about in this class, because you have a genetic heritage? You do some things based upon genes And some things, some of your behavior is a result of your experience, your family backgrounds, your social backgrounds. So we point to these things, ready? From the one side of it, we can point to genetic factors having having an influence on characteristics, personality, behavior. But another one we would, in fact, I'm gonna put up uh, seven of these that um, are pretty important in looking at trying to explain some of the variations in our behavior, um, but about, some people are guessing that around maybe 40, 50% of the variations that we have in our individual personalities can be explained by genetics. The rest of the categories, whether it's prenatal chemical factors, give me a prenatal chemical factor that we say is an environmental factor that can have an influence on how we behave, or what we are like, or some variations. Um, prenatal chemical. The mom takes certain, what we call pterogens, certain chemicals into her body, they can affect the baby. That's a prenatal. Postnatal, anything that's going on chemically that might change us and who we are. We would lump that into the environmental factors, right? But you have other ones. You have gen- general experiential things that we all experience just by being in the world that some of us, um, let's say you were, sh- how many feel like you were influenced in some way, shape or form by events that happened when you were young, like 9-11, how many remember where you were on September 11th? Did that shape, a, uh, that, a, that's a general experiential event that has an influence on some people, yes? There's individual experiential factors that also influence us, things that happen to you, sometimes just moving or being part of a family or a culture that is different than someone around you. And then there's traumatic factors. All this to say that it's much more complex than just saying genes versus experience. And it's probably not even the right question, is your behavior the result of genes or experience? It's probably hard to tease them out in the long run, and so most people say it's not even worth teasing them out. Um, But there are ways in which we have started to narrow down some explanations in some areas. Um, um, There are genes that have an influence, maybe not major ones, but like this. Um, Like for example, you have a dominant and a recessive gene. Anybody know, give me an example of a dominant gene. If you can, uh, uh, eye color. Hair, rolling your tongue. You can roll it. That, that some of you can. Your earlobes, if they're connected or not connected. Some of you have unconnected earlobes. They don't connect here. Some do connect. You can ask your roommate which one. Oh, here's another cool one. Ready? You have like this. This is an ex- this is a probably genetic preference. But cross your hands for me. Ready? Put your hands together. Just cross them. How many of you all have your left thumb on top? And how many have your right thumb on top? Try reversing it and watch how weird it is to switch it. And that's a genetic preference you've had for a long time. How many say it's okay to switch? You don't really care. You do it either both ways. You guys are the weirdest ones of all. No, not really. You're not. But anyway, there's a preference there. Thumb. Um, 
You have pr like, well, there's all kinds. They don't have hu huge effects and, and influences on our behavior. And uh, psychologists are more interested in those genes that really do uh, some of the dominant or recessive genes that have greater influences. But um, it's hard to tease these out. And yeah. Um, I don't think it's, it's it, no, I don't think it's handedness that does this. Is that what you're wondering? Yeah. Let's see, how many people have left thumbs on top? Let me see left thumbs. And how many of you are also left-handed? Yeah. So you are, but not a lot. That may be, or it's the same thing if you cross your arms this way. I mean, it's, you know, you, you have a preference to try and do it the other way. It's even weird to do. Same thing, right? Is it weird? <laughs> Yeah, brains, is that what you said? Yeah. Less common and uh, not as much evidence we, we, we are finding, but um, some of you are still trying that. Other ones that, um, bottom line is this, there's probably, uh, it, it's not, maybe not the right question, is this behavior at all genetics or experience? They're just too interwoven, uh, too hard to kind of pull them out. Identical twin. do we have any identical twins in here? Really? Do you, are you identical? She, she's not in here, obviously, or she would have raised her hand. Any other identical twins? Good. Well, identical twins have some amazing things because genetically you guys are exactly the same and there's ways in which this comes out um, that helps psychologists tease out some of these uh, variables that might have an impact that might be genetic or not. Two other ones, again, just real briefly, continuity versus discontinuity. It's an issue that, again, is the idea is, uh, is develop, does development occur when we watch children and, uh, and humans develop over time? Do they go through this kind of slow, maybe gradual uh, process uh, that's continuous, or is it more discontinuous, kind of like by leaps and bounds? Babies, when they learn to talk, you see them kind of, it, what appears to be a de gradual developmental sequence that, you know, they kind of, you know, they have sounds, cooing sounds, and then they, they start to, you know, have certain ba 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 and they start to put it together a little bit, and they ba 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 and then eventually a little bit, they, they start to ba make certain noises or sounds that seem like a word. Um, and it, 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 you know, so, but others say, no, you can see babies kind of, the lights turn on, and one day they weren't doing this, and then one day they were. And uh, strongly, kind of almost connected to the genetic side, identical twins. Do you remember when you learned to walk? And did you, did you, have you ever heard that? Or did your parents say, no? Like, at the same time? Oh, wow, yeah, that's, that's outside, you know, a little bit longer. What's interesting, I have identical twin uh, brothers, and um, they literally, you can start to see them starting to walk at a, almost, this is weird, all of us start walking, some of us a few years before, uh, a few months before your first birthday, some of just a few weeks before your first birth, first birthday, and then, wow, that's hard to say, and then um, the majority of us will be walking by the time around 15 months, but there's a lot of time in there, but identical twins are almost always picking up at the same days, and so it's like, golly, this unfolds so, so um, amazing, this kind of stepping out, and, and so whether it's, you know, developmental, the, the, the key question here is, uh, how is, our, how is this process, how is this developmental sequence occurring? And uh, that's called continuity, discontinuity. And then another developmental issue is the idea of stability. Do, are we the same? Were you born with your, how many would say that if your, your parents could have predicted your personality when you were five using that to predict what you're like today? You're very similar to what your parents said you were like when you were little. How many of you all, why do you know that? Because some of you are stubborn. Uh, what, what, what were you like at the time and are you the same? Oh, talk a lot as a kid. Your mom says you're real outgoing, talkative, uh, friendly. Others kind of know. I heard stuff like as a kid, I would never cry, and now I have like a pretty laid back. Laid back personality, never cry. You sound like my my daughter Caroline. Did I tell you about? It? She never cries, till we dropped a cell phone on her head one time. She's like <laughs> three weeks old. I'm like, does this child cry ever? And Elisa bent over to pick her up, and the cell phone went bang. And you're like, oh, she cries. <laughs> she doesn't like cell phones on the head. Hmm. Same, same kind of thing. Okay, you can ask this question. Paul, in the book of Acts, New Testament, 
chapter 9. He has an amazing experience where he's one guy at some point, but then his personality did it go through a radical change. If you remember in this chapter 9 of Acts, Paul's whole life was turned upside down. He's very different. But let me ask you this. Was Paul, Saul, still the same, or was his whole personality changed? If people had seen Paul 15 years um, before this event, and then they saw him 15 years after, would they say, he's pretty much still the same guy? He's, no, he's something different about him, of course, but he, he, he's still like that. And so, so, yeah, so the idea is, do, you, do we agree that personalities are stable or unstable or not? I, you know, I, I have a very similar kinds of experience in my life. Very major change in college. I just kind of different. But I think if people saw me that knew me in high school, they'd say, oh, he's kind of, kind of the same. Um, and uh, some would say, well, very different. Well, all that to say, these are issues that developmental psychologists think about, talk about, um, that you should be aware of, and that's stability of personalities, continuity versus discontinuity, and nature versus nurture. Now, when we look at prenatal development and we begin to peer in using um, whatever techniques are possible, um, uh, we, we do find some things. By the way, there are different stages. There's a zygote stage. That baby uh, from conception to two weeks is called the zygote stage. Anybody know what two to eight weeks, what do we call the baby? And they're not in the zygote stage, but they're in the... They're in the embryo stage. The embryo stage from two to eight weeks, and after eight weeks, they're in the, they're in the fetus stage, okay? Fetus stage, eight weeks to birth. Just like Caroline here, okay? Zygote, embryo, and fetus stage, helping us to make some distinctions and to know some different things. Um, that these stages uh, have you know, different ways in which uh, certain trauma or certain um, what we call pterogens, you know, chemicals that moms might be exposed to or take in, have different effects depending upon where this stage, what stage the baby is in. Many moms don't even know they're pregnant. You know, uh, Lisa was, lat she just knew until she got sick around the eighth week. She wasn't just, you know, for her that's, that was the first sign. And uh, other moms know right away or, or sooner. Um, it all varies, you know, depending upon, even, even, you can see the size, you know, it goes from something like this to that. Some moms, you, you could see them. My, my wife in particular, um, she carried our babies this way, like that way. And so some moms, you know, kind of carry them up and down. You, you look at them, they don't even look that pregnant. Uh, my wife, people, we, she'd be like four months pregnant. People would stop her. Oh, are you about to have a baby? She'd go, no, I'm only four months, you know, and then it just kept getting bigger. It was so big <laughs> that I, I made her stand by like the piano and I kept taking pictures every month because I think, how could it get any bigger? I, I kept thinking, is she, what, are we going to have Superman or what? It's like the baby was like <laughs> growing that way. Like, uh, I don't know. It was big. And, and, but from behind and every place else, you'd go, oh, a normal lady right there. And then you'd go, oh. <laughs> All of our babies, it was so bad. At the fifth, four, half month, five months, I'd be in bed like this. And, and uh, we had this fairly small bed. I don't know what it was at the time, maybe a double. I literally had this dream one night <laughs> that I was at Biola's cafeteria standing in line and someone kept bumping me with their tray. And I finally said, dude, st uh, stop hitting me. <laughs> And Elisa says, what? And I go, oh, <laughs> it's your stomach. And I, I, from that night on, I slept somewhere else. <laughs> because seriously, she would bump people, things, um, me. It's bad. She looked fine everywhere else except for the baby. Their mom's like that, huh? They, what's that? She, she, I don't know how tall. She's this tall. She's like five, six, five something. She carry, uh, it's weird. But anyway, all that to say. I don't know what I'm saying. Other than some moms carry them differently up, down, that you can't see. So, but it does take up a lot of room. Uh, ultimately, there are some danger signs. Uh, by the way, things that can cross, we call pterogens, things that can cross from the mom into the baby. Give me an example of a pterogen, something moms shouldn't be exposed to when they're pregnant. 
alcohol can create something called alcohol fetal syndrome, fetal or better yet, fetal alcohol syndrome, which causes babies to uh, brain cells when they're developing, they're hooking up like this. Two nerve cells go like this. Uh, alcohol causes this to, I, I think it's to go, they stop short. I, I don't remember if they stop short or they, it influences the, the connections and it can be very damaging depending upon how much alcohol you take. Um, uh, any other terrigens that you know should be avoided? And mercury, uh, sometimes fish. Caffeine, Caffeine has, definitely has an influence. It definitely does influence the baby and can cause lower birth weights and so moms do want to cut out caffeine. Maybe not, it's not huge amounts, but did you have one? Uh, go ahead, please. No? Um, th these are, yeah. Yes, uh, any, uh, nicotine uh, certainly also has an effect and it crosses. So whether it's exposure to something like measles or the flu or alcohol or x-rays or drugs or nicotine, these are potentially damaging or harmful viruses. Um, that can influence uh, the development of uh, babies. Um, and it just depends upon what time and what, during what stage they're exposed to these things. Are there any questions so far? Um, let me show you then, real quickly, a, a little um, idea. I talked about brain functioning and its uh, uh, relationship to how this brain develops, but well, I think one of the cool things that goes on out there uh, in, in this field in particular in psychology, uh, child psych and developmental psychology, is the way in which um, babies, even, even while they're in the womb, but in particular when they finally emerge, um, how we're able to study and to know what their preferences are, what they like, don't like. Um, that to me is one of the coolest things that we can, be, there's some new, methods and techniques to peer into. Anybody know how we can, for example, know that the ba a baby that's in the womb um, is hearing s s noises and sounds? How do we know that? Anybody know a technique by which you can figure out? So I can say this, ready? When a baby comes out, it prefers its mom's voice, but it prefers also something that it's heard before. How do we know that? How do we know if a one-day-old, three-day-old baby, how can I say that it prefers its mom's voice? You ever heard of the uh, studies in which they figured out how to ask it? How do they ask a baby? Do you prefer your mom's voice or not? That'd be weird, huh? How would, you know, the way you do it? Well. I would say, Eric, you take the baby and put her in her room and have all these different voices come out, and it picks its mom as well. Yeah, in a sense, the ba you, you can ask the baby what it prefers. You could try this. This is a study. You can play sounds, let's say the mom her voice, put a tape recorder, um, of her saying a nursery rhyme. Uh, let's say it's, I don't know, some nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb and she keeps saying it. Um, but it, when the baby comes out, what, what a cool technique is you give it, this child the ability to suck on this pacifier or this one, and when he sucks on this one, it plays the mom's recording of that one. When it sucks over here on this one, it plays either a stranger or the mom saying something that the baby's never heard before, and the baby sucks on this pacifier longer than on this one. That's cool, huh? Like, so sucking longer on this is something that shows, wait, I like this. You can do the same thing and have them pictures and images come up if they suck on this one versus this one. That's one way to ask a baby, what do you prefer? Because they get to determine that, what they stare at. So this video clip will show you some of those techniques um, of, of peering in and looking and seeing what they prefer, and then we'll show you um, the newborn. That's Caroline. Yeah, sorry about the quality of that thing. I'm, I'm not sure what's happened here, but newborns have this great ability to begin to respond in ways that we're uncovering just some cool things that we didn't know before. One of the things you could do, by the way, what, that, that one looked at the baby's ability to suck from early on and therefore kind of ask it what it preferred. Staring, babies will do this, they will stare at something that they find new and different, but just like you, they get bored and they yawn when they get bored. And so they'll be looking at something after a while, they're like, okay, show me something new, man. And if you show them a new face, like the same face over and over again, if they, you kept seeing a face, they would after a while get used to it and then eventually if they see this new face, 
that pops up, you can see them go, oh, there's a new thing there. And so you know boredom means that they can be, you can begin to exploit. Ah, they're remembering something. Um, and they like, you could see, let's say, new stimuli, for example. Some reflexes. This is like the rooting reflex would come into play. Last thing I want you to do, and then we'll, we'll get out of here, we'll be just simply noting that the way in which we look at preferences, uh, we've illustrated some of this. Sometimes you can see they may prefer certain smells. Same way by just simply looking at how babies respond. And then the last area be that, that before we get into intellectual and cognitive development um, is looking at social development. So here's what I'd like you to do. Look at material on social and cognitive development of young babies and children, and uh, we'll complete and finish chapter three next Wednesday. Um, we'll look primarily at um, some of these early social responses, and then I'll show you some video clips on Harry Harlow. Any questions before we, we wrap this up today? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.